me, and I hope say encouragement and a blessing for y'all. If you will, take your Bibles with me and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 2. While y'all are turning there, I'll give a recap of kind of what we talked the last time. Last time we started to look at the life of Elisha. We went through uh, part one. I'll go through these points briefly just to kind of really get us caught up and dive right on into it. The first point was the first time his name was mentioned in the Bible. We see where God actually told Elijah to go through and find this certain man, Elisha, and anoint him to be uh, a prophet in his chamber. He was given the location, he was given details, he was given uh, extra prophecy of what he was going to do. Uh, like I said, he was told the location, Abel Mahala, it was in uh, Palestine, east of the Jordan River. He was told who his father was, and he so he just had to go through the city and ask for the father so he could uh, find the son to get to him. The second point was the finding of Elisha. In that, we see that Elisha, he's out in the field. He's plowing with the yoke of oxen. He was busy. He was working. He wasn't just sitting on his thumb, just expecting handouts to get things taken care of. The third point was the feeding by Elisha. That's where he took the yoke of oxen that he was using to feed the people that was of the household. Like I said, last time, my best guess is there was probably at least two yoke of oxen that he slew to feed these people. So... I imagine there was a lot of people in this single household. It probably would have been a process, probably would have been a couple hours to do all the skinning, the curing, to just do everything to feed this household. It was not a slow process. Then the fourth point, we see the following of Elisha. We notice Elisha, he went out and followed the man of God. He wasn't told to follow the man of God. What we saw here was he had the his coat, if you will, he had it thrown over him. And then he, you have Elisha, he follows him anyway. It doesn't say he was never told to directly go and follow me, but it did say that he ministered unto him. It doesn't give all the details of this, but we can deduce that he helped with the needs of Elijah. The fifth point was the fellowship with Elisha. This was right before he was called out to be with the Lord. He went from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan even though he knew that he had a short time left on this earth, he was willing to serve the Lord to the very end, which is a blessing to glean and learn. Then think about the things that he would have gleaned by serving under Elijah. Would have, the things he would have learned and gleaned, he probably would have never forgotten, and it would have helped encourage his ministry to be the servant that he needed to be at the time. After that, we saw the following request. He was given the... Basically the same thing that uh, Solomon was given. He was able to make a single request if he was to see Elijah called up to be with the Lord. And if he saw that, his request was that he would have a double portion of thy spirit. I'm sure he knew that the Lord's hand was all over the life of Elijah. He probably got to see many of the miracles. The personal relationship that he would have had with the Lord would have been a blessing to be able to see. And you can, can't help but understand why that he wanted to have that double portion, to have that kind of power over his life and over his ministry. The people that I imagine that he got to see Elijah help, probably the people that was counseled, that was encouraged to serve the Lord, would have been a blessing. Then after that, we looked, number seven, we looked at the fiery chariot. This was where Elisha, he got to see something that we can only imagine. I know we've got TVs in our living rooms. We can watch these things that show us and we can kind of get that kind of visual but to see this in person it would have been amazing to see all of a sudden you've got horses on fire and you have a chariot that's coming out of heaven in a whirlwind and he's going and he's caught up inside that chariot that was his predecessor i couldn't help but imagine that he probably would have had fear overcome him in that moment and then to see that he had a dear friend caught up to heaven to be with the lord what a sight that would have been and after that, number eight, you had the first miracle. This, what was interesting about this is how he performed the exact same miracle that his predecessor performed for his final miracle, where he took his mantle and he smote the waters, and the waters were divided hither and thither, is the way it says. And then he went and walked on dry ground. That, that's amazing to really think about. I can only imagine having that kind of power with God that I could smite waters and they would spread and I could walk on dry ground. After that, we got to look at the faithless. This was where the sons of the prophets, they, at the beginning, they was telling him that how he knew that 
his master was going to be taken from him that day. But I called them faithless because they didn't believe that God could actually do it. Right whenever Elisha comes back, they could they could tell that Elijah wasn't there. Yeah, Elijah wasn't there anymore. They also realized that they had, that he had the spirit of Elijah on him. But to think they didn't have enough faith in God that God could take a man from this earth and that he wouldn't lose him. Then what got worse from there is how they was willing to go search for a man that was no longer on this planet. Just to think about that. I believe they had 50 men with a single goal to accomplish. After that, number 10, we looked at the fountain healed. I believe this was the last point that I was hit. How you had these men of the city, they came out to the prophets. They basically told him, everything's good, but the waters are bad and the ground is barren. It doesn't sound like everything's good to me. But how he uh, was able to take a small cruiser, uh, a small cup, if you will, that had salt in it, he threw it on the waters to heal them. But I couldn't help but notice there was two miracles performed here. First, you had the waters, how they was healed. But the second uh, miracle that was performed is the land would no longer be barren or empty. They'd be able to grow food once again like they once had in the past. They would have waters that were good for them, that were healthy. And now we're getting to where we're going to really start this morning. So we're going to look at point number 11. It's the fallen children. This is in chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now I'll go ahead and read that. It says, And he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned it back, and looked on them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. There came forth two she-bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. Like I said, I always find this one interesting. Of all the miracles that he done, to think of how many preachers can you think of that went and they cursed these children because they said something, they done something that was disrespectful. Like I said, we know that obviously this preacher, he's had the blessings of God on his life. He's able to perform so many of these miracles that we kind of just briefly recapped. Then you have these children, they come out of this city. We don't know exactly how many children there was that came out of this city. The big detail we got was how many children the judgment was cast upon. But we know that they were unruly and they had no respect for their elders. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I don't think it was too long ago you was able to see on the news how you'd have these teens or these kids, how they was going out and they was trying to knock out these elderly people just to see if they could, just for the fun of it. It's sad that that's even going on in America today. No longer are the, is the youth trying to respect the elders that we can glean so much wisdom and knowledge from. Instead, they're wanting to go beat them up just to see if they can. But even here, they had no respect for this man of God. They told him, go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. Just think about that. They was picking on him because he didn't have much hair on top of his head. That's not a reason to pick on somebody. There's this thing called law of sowing and reaping. I was actually talking about that a little bit at work. Not exactly for that context, but just think about that. They was picking on somebody that had the blessings of God on his life and knowing that he was able to call down so many of these <coughs> blessings from God and have those prayers answered. I wouldn't want to mess with this man of God. If anything, I want this man of God on my side to help me, to encourage me to try to live a better life. But this preacher does something that I've personally never seen before. Kind of read about it here and there. It says, he curses them in the name of the Lord. Just to think about that. I think there was one other spot I was reading this week in Nehemiah where he cursed a certain people and he began to pluck out their hair. But here, like I said, I don't know exactly what he said. I don't know if he just said, I curse you in the name of the Lord. I, I don't know all the details, and I dare not say because I really don't know. But we do notice that immediately after he curses them, the judgment was swift. It didn't wait a couple months or a couple days or a couple years. It was immediate. 
There was no delay. It's almost <clears> like I've heard the pastor, he talked about uh, praying for somebody that the Lord will take their sleep from them to open their eyes to a certain matter. But in this case, it was different. Like I said, you have him, I can only imagine him, he was so mad and he asked the Lord to intervene and punish them. And then to imagine that he had such a close relationship with God that he answers that prayer immediately. He didn't delay, he didn't slack in uh, delaying or putting on this judgment. We can look, we can see exactly how the judgment happened. It's, I read the whole verse 24, it says, And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Could you imagine? You just got cursed, and you know it's from God. All of a sudden, you have these two she-bears that are coming out to get you. Can you imagine that? I can only imagine just how... Swift that judgment was, how these bears, they probably came in swinging. First kid, second kid, third kid, and then on and on until it actually ends up casting judgment on 42 children, is what it says towards the back. It says, and tear 40 and two children of them. How many children do you think was there? We know it was more than 42, just based on that context. Could have been 50, could have been 100, but the fear that would have came on them after seeing that judgment happen on them so quickly... They probably went and told their mom. They told them, hey, look what just happened. We just had our friends over here. They just got beat up by these bears after the prophet put a curse on them. Just to imagine that. Then verse 25, we can see where the preacher, he goes up to Mount Carmel. Then it says he returned back to Samaria. I don't know the... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know the significance of that right off, right now, but I'm sure there is one. Then we're going to look at, in chapter 3, verses 9 through 14, we can see the fearful kings. If I can find it, there it is. Verse 9, so the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. Verse 10, and the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, "This or Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Verse 12, And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Edom, went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father, and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Verse 14, And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. Right here, like just read it, we'll kind of give a brief recap. You have these three kings. You have the king of Israel, his name was Jehoram. The king of Judah, his name was Jehoshaphat. Then you have the king of Edom. I forgot to write his name down. Not a whole lot of details really given here of why they were where they was. What we do know is they had their herds with them, and I'm sure they had their families with them. But they went seven days' journey. We know that they didn't have any water to water the people or the flocks. Then you have Jehoshaphat. He wanted to talk to a prophet of God to find out if there was going to be delivered into the hands of Moab. Just to think about that. You have one guy, he's wanting to actually talk to a man of God to see, am I going to be delivered? Am I going to have judgment cast on me in the hands of the, the Moabites? Then you have one of the servants of Israel. He points out that there is a prophet that in verse 11, that uh, poured water on the hands of Elijah. Just think about that. Then you have in verse 12, you have the three kings, they go out and talk to the men of God, Elijah. In 13, we can look, we see he rebukes the king of Israel. I'll read it. Where he says, what have I to do with thee? That was towards the king of Israel. 
Then he tells them, Get thee to the prophets of thy fathers and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. What I couldn't help but notice is, actually I had to backtrack to see who was the, not just who the king of Israel was, but who was his family. It challenges him to go and talk to the prophets of his parents. For those that don't know, his father was Ahab. He was the one that had all the prophets of Baal. We'll go to 1 Kings chapter 16 and read these four verses real quick, 30 through 33. He says, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took the wife of Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which had which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Did you catch that last sentence? I'll read it again. It says, And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. He didn't have any love or compassion like he should have. He was rebelling against God wholeheartedly. He was serving all these false gods, these false images. The main one that we know of was Baal worship. But I couldn't help but notice how he didn't even regard the presence of this man. He wouldn't have even talked to him had it not been for I believe it was the king of Judah. Let's see if I can find that. Yeah, verse 14 says, And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I surely stand, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look towards thee, nor see thee. Just think about that. Elisha had so much respect for the king of Judah that he was willing to overlook the king of Israel's sins, if you will, and actually give them the answers that they was looking for. In verse or, Point 13, we can see the filling of the water in verses 15 through 20. It says, But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet the valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beast. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. Verse 19, And ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city and shall fell every good tree and stop all wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. Verse 20, And it came to pass in the morning when the meal offering was offered that behold there came water by the way of Edom and the country was filled with water. In verse 15, we notice that something interesting happens that I don't believe is anywhere else in the Scripture. I don't quote me on that for sure, but I, I don't think it is. He, was, he told these kings, says, but now bring me a minstrel. I don't know if y'all know what that is, but for those that don't know, what a minstrel is is essentially it's a musician. I've read in other places that suggest that he could have been a singer as well, but right here it just says that he played. So I don't know what he played exactly. I can't help but imagine it might have been a harp. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards, but I can't prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. But I couldn't help but notice it was only after that they had the minstrel come in and play the music, after the music was played, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, giving him the words that they needed to say. Essentially, he prophesied to the kings, telling them that they need to fill the valley full of ditches. They need to go out. They need to do something. They need to go work. And you know that would have been hard for them because they didn't have water. They was already thirsty. I imagine they might not have had much food at the time either. But just imagine the look on the king's face when you have this prophet. He tells them to make the valley full of ditches. Not just one or two here. Make it full of ditches. Put 
these holes all over this ground. I can't help but imagine this was uh, for a twofold purpose. Purpose one was so they would be able to water all of man and all of their animals. But purpose number two, I can't help but imagine, is to believe or to give these men faith in God that he was able to keep his word to fulfill the miracles and the prophecies that was given to them. But I couldn't help but notice towards the verse 20. It says, And it came to pass when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom. Notice, it didn't just happen all of a sudden. It was after they had took the time, they had already done the work, they had dug all these ditches that they was told to dig. It was after they had made the sacrifice as well, they had made this meat offering. Right here it says it came past in the morning when the meat offering was offered. After that is when the miracle actually happened. It wasn't filled by some great rain. But they got to see the Lord move in a way that I imagine they never would have imagined was possible. Just to imagine you're in this valley, if you will, and you're looking, you just dug these ditches because you need water and you're doing what the man of God told you to do. He made a promise to them in verse 18. And then after that, to imagine how the Lord's all of a sudden going to fill these ditches up with water. There's no rain clouds coming through. I imagine there wasn't a fog that kind of came through like there was for Adam and Eve first thing in the morning. I imagine that it must have kind of just either came from the ground or might have just had water just coming from above. I don't know for sure. But to imagine that, how all of a sudden these men are all getting watered from nowhere essentially. How God, how He continuously... He keeps His Word. Promise after promise that God makes, He always keeps His Word. He gives them water whenever they needed water. We can look in the Old Testament whenever Israel was going through the wilderness, how He fed them whenever they didn't have food. The Lord always provides for His people. We just have to have enough faith to believe that God's going to do what He said He's going to do. In verse 18, we can also see another promise that the Lord was going to deliver the Moabites into their hands. And I love this next part. Point number 14, we can see the fallen soldiers. It's verses 21 through 25. It says, And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they arose, they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. Verse 23, And they said, This is blood. The kings are surely slain. They have smitten one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forth smiting the Moabites even in their country. Verse 25, And they beat down the cities and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees, only in Kerharaseth left they the stones, thereof howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. Just to imagine for a moment, you've got these soldiers of the other camp, the Moabites, all of a sudden, early in the morning I imagine, they come and they see this valley. They don't see the ditches. All they see is the water, and I imagine... I imagine it was a sunrise in all honesty that you have this sunrise and all of a sudden you see these waters how it makes it look as red as blood. You can see the prophecies literally come to pass. Like I said, these, water, these holes, they were filled with ditches. The water was used to not only nourish the people but also the flocks. I should put that on the last point. But to imagine how the Lord gave them a false hope how they saw what they believed to be blood. How it wasn't blood at all. It was just water. Like I said, I imagine it was a sunrise. And they were so arrogant, if you will. They thought that all the king's armies had been slain. Because, like I said, what they perceived to be blood was nothing but water. So just imagine, you're camp, you're excited. 
I imagine you don't have all the armor on like you need to. So you're going into the camp of Israel, and you find Israel, they're all armed up. They're ready to fight. You're expecting an easy victory, and you just get wiped out. Just to imagine that. I'm trying to remember, I believe it's 25. Verse 24 says, And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites, so that they fled before them. But they went forth smiting the Moabites, even in their country. Israel looks like they chased them all the way down and basically killed them. They wiped out the Moabites right here. The prophecies, how they came to pass, even as the Lord said, He even told them to, after doing all this, to basically cut down all the trees, fill up all the wells. Verse 25 is where it's at. It says, And they beat down the cities, and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone, and filled it, and they stopped all the wells of water, and filled all the good trees. They done what the Lord told them. Only in this one place they left stones. How be it? The slingers went about it and smote it. They done what the Lord told them to do. They was obedient. They done what God said to do. And see the blessings that come about. Then we're going to come to chapter 4. We, this is point number 15. It says, the failed, or this is the failed widow. This is verses 1 through 7. It says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me what hast thou in the house. And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Verse 3, Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set, up, set aside that which is full. Verse 5, So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the old stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. I called it the failed widow because you had this man. Apparently he had passed away before he could repay his debts. Throughout the scriptures, there's not really any detail of how this man really lived his life. She's talking good about him towards the first part. says how that thy servant did fear the Lord. It talks about that, but that's all it really tells us. It doesn't give us really any detail on this life. This man, he may have been a very great man. And it's quite possible that he might not have known anything about the financial realm. But we do know that he got in over his head. That's something that we should all have a fear of getting in over our head. And he didn't real and he wouldn't realize until it was too late for them. He passed away before he could pay the debtors that he owed. He got in over his head. We can see that his wife, she didn't really have anything left. And the lender was going to come and take away the children as repayment. There would have been bondmen. Well, I don't know for sure is how long there would have been bondmen. I don't know that. I don't know if it would have been a couple months or a couple years, but they would have had to work to pay back the services rendered to his father. That much we do know. Like I said, I cannot say for sure just how long it would have been. It might have been indefinitely or it could have been just for a small period of time. But even throughout the scriptures, there's not any sign where debt is used as a good thing. There's not. It's always negative. It's never a good thing. But as they go to the prophet, she's pleading because she knows that she can't repay the debts that she has. And the only thing that she really has is she has this vessel that has a little bit of oil in it. That's what we do know. And he tells her, the prophet does, go and gather all the vessels that she can and borrow not a few. 
There's something significant about that when you really think about it. Don't borrow a few. I want to show you just how great our God is. He's going to do a miracle that you've never seen before. Just to imagine how, just imagine you have a hundred vessels in your home and you have this one little pot that has a little bit of oil. And you're told essentially to go and pour the oil, fill up all these vessels. This pot wasn't very big. And to imagine filling up all these vessels, it would have been like a hundredfold investment. It would have turned into so much more than it initially was to start out with. But he, she goes, they shut the doors, they I imagine they begin to fill up all these vessels one after another. And then all of a sudden she's like, bring me another vessel. Like, I can't, that's all. That's all we have. We don't have any more vessels to fill up. Just to imagine. Then she goes back to the prophet and he basically tells her, go and sell all the oil and pay off all of your debts. And then they get to live on the excess. I believe that's in verse 7. It says, Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Just to imagine that, the blessing, how it would have been, what initially looked like an extremely bad thing for the failed widow, essentially it became a blessing how the Lord was actually taking care of his own, what he always promised he would. We'll look at point number 16. We can see the faithful one. This is in verses 8 through 17. In chapter 4 it says, And it fell on a day when Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Verse 10, let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day when he came thither, and he turned into the chamber, and lay there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he, when he had called her, she stood in the door and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha has said unto her, according to the time of life. Right here we can look at the faithful woman. This woman, she had done what she could to take care of the man of God every time that he was in. She would give him bread, she would feed him. Then, not sure how, or if it was just all of a sudden process, how she would have fellowship with him. She realized that this was a holy man of God. That's what it says in verse 9 towards the last. It says, I perceive that this is an holy man of God which passeth by us continually. So I imagine you have Elisha, he's going back and forth from place to place, trying to do what he can what the Lord tells him to do. Then you have this woman. She has a heart to actually help and be a blessing to the man of God. Just to think about that. She was wanting to be a blessing. That's the reason why she was wanting to do this. In verse number 10, we can actually see how she was really wanting to be a blessing. It says, Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. She was giving him a place to, for shelter. And it says, Let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. Just imagine that for a moment. She was willing to go so far to take care of this man of God. She was, I believe they call it like a prophet's chamber. Like I say, they gave him a place for shelter, a place to sleep in. They gave him a place for rest. That was a bed. We can see a place for reading and or studying. That was a table. We can see how she provided a light a lamp or a candlestick. Then also a place to sit. This would be a stool. 
We can see where he came and stayed in verse number 11. says, And it fell on the day that he came thither and turned in to the chamber and lay there. Verse 14 through 17, he makes a promise to the, her and tells her that she was going to have a child at a very certain season. It uh, said the time of life, I believe, is the way it worded it. I personally believe this is a reference to springtime. We know that it gives no insight to how old that they were. What we do know is that it says that her husband was old in verse 14. You can't help but imagine that this prophet, after he was had been blessed so many times by this lady, that he was wanting to turn around and try to be a blessing to them. But he didn't know what her needs were at the time. But you had the servant Gehazi, I believe it was, he knew that she was childless. We can see that in verse 14. And then they make the promise that she's going to have a child at a certain season. And we notice that she did have that child. And verse 17 says, And the woman conceived and bare a son at the season that Elisha had said unto her, and according to the time of life. Point number 17, we can look at the fallen child. This is in verses 18 through 20. It says, And when the child was grown, it, it fell on a day that he went out to his fathers, to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, or to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him, he brought him to his mother. And he sat on her knees till noon and then died. It's like, just to imagine, there was a pre period of time that it happened. We don't know how old he was. He might have been 15, he might have been 20. I don't know for sure. But we notice that one of these days comes by that his father sees that he has a problem. He says, my head, my head. So he sends him to his mother because the father, he didn't know what to do. He just assumed that the mother did. Then just to imagine that after all this time passes, he's laying on his mother's knees and all of a sudden he passes away. Then number 18, this will probably be my last one. I'll try to read it a little bit faster just to get this point done. The faith-filled woman, this is in verses 21 through 37, says, And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Verse 24, And she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi his servant, Bring yonder, or behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, It is well with thee. Is it well? With thy husband, is it well with thy child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Verse 28, Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand. And go thy way, if thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again. Lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I, shall, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them, and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him, and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. And when Elisha was come unto the house, Behold, the child was dead, and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his mouth, and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Verse 35. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up, and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes, and he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when he, she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Verse 37. Then she went in and fell at his feet, and bowed him herself to the ground, and took up her son, and went out. Right here, like I said, you have the faithful woman. Faith-filled woman. She knew that her child had passed away. 
we noticed that she still had hope that everything was going to be all right. She has her son put on the bed of the prophet. Her husband, it appears that he has no idea what's going on with the child. We see that in verse 22 and 23. It says, And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. Verse 23, And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. I said, it looks like he has no idea what's actually going on with his own child. But we notice that she makes haste to try to get to the prophet. She wanted to get there as fast as she could. We don't know how long this would have taken. It's quite possible it could have taken 30 minutes. It could have taken up to, I imagine, two hours. But she knew deep inside herself that her child, he had passed away. But she had enough hope in the man of God that he was able to help and heal her child. In verse number 27, even the prophet, he doesn't even know what's going on whenever she comes up, but he was able to tell that she had a burden on her heart. She was vexed. She had a burden. After that, he finds out kind of what's going on. He doesn't know that the child's dead at the time. He sends his servant Gehazi with his staff to put it on him, thinking that's going to be all it takes to heal whatever ailment has befallen on him but it doesn't work. He puts it on there. He doesn't hear anything. He doesn't say anything. There's nothing that goes on. Then Gehazi has to come all the way back. So imagine, potentially a couple hours have already gone by. She had to get there. He went back. He came right back again. Now they're all going to go back together once again to see this child. Like I said, we don't know exactly how long this would have taken. Like I said, I can imagine it could have took up to a couple hours for all this process. But I couldn't help but notice he ends up performing essentially the exact same miracle that Elijah did by bringing the child back the exact same way by laying on him to warm him. We can see it in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 20 through 22. I'm not going to read that for lack of time. But after doing that a couple of times, he walks around, he lays on the child, his body begins to warm up, the child revives, and immediately he sneezes seven times. I'm sure there's a significance about that, the same being number of completion, but I can't say for certain, just being honest with you. But I couldn't help but notice, looking back at her faith the entire way, she's always saying, it is well or it shall be well. She believed, she had faith that her son was going to come back. I don't believe that she was surprised at all whenever her son was truly brought back to life. She had hope, she had faith in the Lord. But I couldn't help but think about the joy that she must have had once she saw her child alive once again. Just to think about that, I believe it was in 37. Lost my place. Oh well. But how his child was, or her child was brought back, how she kind of fell at the prophet's knees. Just to think about that, the hope that she had. And she was told to basically take up her son after he was brought back to life. I'm going to close right there. Go ahead, stop it. I'm going to dismiss this in a word of prayer. I, dear Lord, just want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you Lord, for the blessings you've bestowed upon us. I want to thank you Lord, for another opportunity to be able to open your word, be able to just look at the life of Elisha, the many blessings and things that he went through in his short ministry here on this earth. I want to thank you Lord, for your goodness. I want to thank you Lord, for your grace. Ask Lord just to be with the services done here today, be with the preaching, be with the singing. If there's any lost souls come through these doors, ask Lord just open their eyes and let them realize their need of a Savior before it's eternally too late. We'll thank you and praise you for all that you do in Jesus' sweet and precious name. Amen. Amen.